Uh, it's great to see so many people here um, at 8.30, and I just want to start by um, really acknowledging what an amazing conference this has become. I just ran into Dave, David Grizzle, and we were talking just in, in my short tenure how much this has grown and, and how important it is as a forum to talk about safety. So I commend uh, Paul and Trish for their leadership and continuing to grow that. Uh, and I also thank you for including me, and I'm very happy I can stay and watch the Archie League Awards tonight, which I've been looking forward to. Um, but I have to say I was a little intimidated in trying to figure out what to talk about this morning. Um, usually I talk about next gen, that's a big part of my job, but I noticed you have an entire, or had an entire panel on next gen. Uh, talk a lot about UAS, but you had a very informative panel on UAS yesterday. Uh, and I have no intention of talking about air traffic control reform. So, um, so Trish actually suggested I should talk about my experience of, of becoming a pilot. And I decided that would be a good framing to talk about some of my experiences at FAA, but also more generally about um, general aviation and, and, and what's really been my curiosity about general aviation uh, since I joined FAA, trying to understand where it is and, and, uh, and where, it's, uh, where it's going. So, so I'm gonna start this story in 1979. And you can see that I've titled my presentation, Who Takes 35 Years to Get a Pilot's License? Um, in 1979, I was a freshman in college, and Paul and I were just talking about college tuitions. My first semester tuition was $235. Uh, $235. Um, I wrote a check for that. And, you know, that was back when, I know I'm sounding like an old person, that's when you could actually work your way through college. Um, but one of the courses that they had was ground school. You could get three credit hours for ground school, and I thought that sounded like a pretty interesting thing. So I, I took that class, and then I took a couple flying lessons, uh, and then ran out of money. Uh, so it was never in the realm of possibility for me to afford to become a pilot when I was that age, but that's where my flying lessons started. So if you fast forward 35 years, um, in 2014 I had recently joined the FAA, and I made a, a decision to go ahead and get my pilot certificate. Um, and I did it for a couple reasons. One is I thought it would be very helpful to me in understanding next gen, and as you probably know, part of my job is to be the chief next gen officer, and you can learn about all these technologies all day long, but if you don't actually have some experience of them, um, it's very difficult to bring all of those complex pieces together. That was probably the major motivator for me. Um, I also wanted to be a user of the system, experience the system, uh, but also I really was curious about GA and what had happened to GA over the last several decades. And you know GA has gone through a lot of changes uh, through various economic factors. And also the safety uh, record of GA has remained at, at sort of a plateau and I wanted to understand some of that better. So 2014, March through October, $11,000 later, uh, plus various gadgets I probably didn't need to buy, um, I got my certificate. And uh, Administrator where to actually signed it, and it was a really terif terrific experience, I think, um, really impacted my work at the FAA. So I want to talk a little this morning about what I've learned and um, talk about what's happened since 1979, because that ends up being a sort of a pivotal year, not just because I was a freshman in college. So apologies to those in the back, but this is really a chart that's worth the effort. So let me talk about it a bit. It, spans a 50-year period from 1962 to 2012, and it plots the production of general aviation, light general aviation aircraft in the United States. So light general aviation means piston, it means under 12,500 pounds. It's not helicopters or gliders, it's your Cessnas and your Moonies and that type of thing. And what this shows is that in 1979, there were over 18,000 airplanes built in the United States, light GA. Then it went into a nosedive. Now the gray shaded areas are recessions. So like, like a lot of businesses, like the airlines I can attest, you always sort of ramp up right before a recession. So that's an unfortunate dynamic. 
But you see in 1979, that production just fell off a cliff. And over the next couple years, about 95% of that production went away. And it plummeted straight down to about 1,000 a year. And as you can see, it never recovered. And I became really fascinated in trying to understand why, why did that happen and why has it never recovered? And then, of course, what's going to happen going forward? So as I talked to different people and looked at, at different studies and tried to figure this out, there really were five um, sort of buckets, five explanations, which I think you could say came together as sort of a perfect storm uh, to, to impact general aviation. Liability, um, which I'll talk about, and, 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 and manufacturer's ability to get insurance. Uh, cost, it's very expensive to fly. If you buy a new Cessna 172, it's a $375,000 airplane. So it's expensive, but there's also the question of why is it so expensive? Why can you get a, an amazing piece of technology from Lexus for $40,000, but for three or $400,000, you're getting 40-year-old technology? And technology itself, and I looked at technology as perhaps something that's going to help revive general aviation. The technology that GA pilots can get in the cockpit through ADSBN, the weather, the, the traffic, the nav, nav situational awareness, uh, is that gonna be a game changer? Alternative transportation, and here my thought was, you know, in 1979, something else happened about that time, which was deregulation of the airline industry and the rise of the low-cost carrier, particularly Southwest. So what impact did the airfares have on GA? And then, of course, demographics, the very aging uh, pilot community. But again, why is that happening? So after I had worked with this uh, a bit, I went to MITRE, which is our research um, arm that's funded by the government, has a lot of really smart people that think about these issues a lot. And I said, what do you guys think about this? Have you looked at the issue? Are there other factors that we should think about? So let me just kind of run through these very quickly. Uh, liability, I won't spend a lot of time on. Uh, I was in law school in the 1980s, and so I heard a lot about uh, product liability and the need for reform. And when I was out of law school, I <clears throat> worked for a while as a trial attorney, and I worked on some product liability cases for aircraft manufacturers. And there were some big jury awards that uh, caused uh, premiums to go up a lot. So this is a really shocking statistic, but in 1979, when there were 18,000 aircraft produced, the cost to insure those from a liability point of view was about $1,300 an airplane. A couple years later, that number was over $100,000. And part of that was production went down so much, so you're not spreading it among as many aircraft. But also with the product liability, um, it just raised the premium. So you had this incredible uh, dynamic where the cost of a new airplane just went up $100,000. So that's a pretty good explanation of, of what may have happened. But the odd thing is that um, fixing that didn't really make the problem go away. So in 1994, so about 10 years after the problem was there, Congress passed a law uh, GA Revitalization Act, and uh, put limits on that liability. So it sort of fixed the problem, if you will. But it didn't really move the needle. It didn't cause a big uptick. You do see an uptick in the late 90s, but that's, that's really, I think, better explained by the fact that a company called Cirrus came onto the scene and started making airplanes. So there you see... Cessna exits the market in 1986 and decides to stop making um, aircraft. And then you get the uh, act from Congress and, and really not much of a reaction to that. So affordability. Planes are really expensive. And um, I don't know what, um, let me just fast forward here. This is a 1974 um, Cessna 172. If you bought one today, it would look a lot like this, with the exception of the panel inside. 
But that's really old technology. Now, I don't know what you drove in 1974, but if you think about cars from 1974, um, uh, it's, it's really old technology. The interesting thing is that between 1971 and 1979, so an eight-year period of the 70s, there were 88,000 airplanes, light GA, produced in the United States. 88,000, that's a huge number of airplanes. That's over half the airplanes that exist uh, in the GA fleet today. And so, while you probably haven't seen a Pinto lately, I'm guessing, or a Vega, um, I bet you have seen a 172, and they're just, they're everywhere. They're, they're well made, they last a really long time, and if you're interested, you can find one for relatively inexpensive, and you can refurbish it for a lot less than you can buy a new one. So manufacturers are competing with this massive fleet of existing aircraft, which, while quite dated, um, is still out there. And I know because of, I am perpetually shopping for, for airplanes, so I'm trying to figure this out. Uh, do you buy a new airplane? Do you buy an old airplane and fix it up? And it's not an easy question. So the other factor here, airplanes have gone up um, inflation adjusted considerably over that time period. Wages have not gone up uh, considerably over that time period. And you know we could spend a lot of time talking about that, but if, for, for those of you old enough to remember, in the 70s and 80s, you probably maybe knew some doctors or lawyers that had airplanes. It was not an uncommon thing. And of course, there are a lot of fatalities associated with doctors and airplanes, uh, but it was a pretty common um, activity it's less likely today that a doctor or a lawyer is going to be able to afford, say, a new Cirrus SR-22, which is about $750,000 for basically a single engine airplane. So the wages have not, and, and you could have another conversation about in, in income disparity and the like, but that has been uh, certainly a factor in this. Now technology, I mentioned that I had uh, sort of a view on technology and was focused on the new technology that's coming into the, to the um, cockpit. MITRE had a very different take on technology. And so if you go back to this production chart, we've added a second line on the bottom that shows turbine aircraft that are produced in the GA market. And you can see it's really not very many airplanes that are produced, um, but if you look in 1978, it was only 4% of the shipments of aircraft, but it was 43% of the revenue for the manufacturers. So a lot more revenue associated with turbine engines than pistons. And as you see over time, turbine aircraft have actually kind of gone up a little bit while pistons have gone down. But if you look at the revenue associated, all the money's in the turbines. So right now, 96% of the revenue for GA manufacturers comes from turbine engines. So it's another, it's another disruptive factor in the GA market. And you, I think one way you can look at that is the high-end GA, which means no longer piston, uh, is, is taking a lot of attention and a lot of focus. Um, and the piston has become a less important part for manufacturers. On the low end, you're also seeing some erosion. So experimental aircraft, uh, growing sector, 139% increase over a 20-year period versus an 8% decrease for uh, your typical uh, piston aircraft. So alternative transportation. This seemed kind of an easy one. If, if, if you were uh, a family of four or six in the 1970s, it cost a fortune to fly your family to Disneyland. You could actually kind of justify buying an airplane. They're not that expensive. Um, and the economics sort of worked on a personal level. Same was true on a corporate level. Airfare was very expensive. Uh, airline deregulation in 1978 unleashed the low-cost carrier. Southwest took over the country. Uh, airfares plummeted. We all know that, that story. It was more fun if you were Southwest than if you were one of the big airlines at that point but airfares came down pretty dramatically. Um, so that's, that's a pretty clear uh, dynamic. So the economics of ownership kind of went away. 
One of the things that Miter pointed out is that that was also true for short trips. So if you think about a 150 mile trip, um, the cars now, back to my Pinto there, are much better. You probably wouldn't want to take a 150 mile trip in a Pinto, but in your Lexus or your Jeep or even your Kia, you're gonna get a much more reliable and a much more comfortable mode of transportation. So the GA aircraft is no longer really competitive um, in that space. And then finally, uh, demographics, bad news, we're all getting older. Um, and for pilots, you have a lot of post-World War II uh, pilots. The GI Bill was used for a lot of pilot training. Baby boomers, uh, a lot of baby boomers, uh, of which I'm at the tail end of, are pilots. Not so much with Gen Xers. And that can be uh, part of the cost issue that we talked about, a variety of factors. But the reality is we have a very old uh, I should say, sorry, aging uh, pilot population. And the new pilots are very focused on different things than, than the older generation. Very focused on the career as, a, as an airline pilot. It's an awesome time to become an airline pilot. The last 30 years were very tumultuous, but going forward, looking like a pretty good job. Uh, there's, there's a demand for pilots. And then on the experimental light sports side, a lot of that um, diversion into that, into that space. So those were the factors, and I just wanted to kind of walk you through that. It was, it was sort of my process, my thought process over the, over the last couple of years trying to understand um, GA. I don't want to leave you with a, the impression that I think it's all doom and gloom, because I think there's a lot of uh, good things on the horizon, and we're doing some, some things in that space that I want to talk about um, briefly. But... Um, I wanted to come back to my uh, learning how to fly and, and understand uh, aviation better by, by doing that. And I think for me that was, that was successful. It has enabled me and I think the agency to, to connect better with the GA community and to understand the GA concerns better. Um, and certainly for me to understand the technology better. And it helps that I actually enjoy uh, doing it. It makes it a pleasurable uh, experience. But, it's also allowed me to be on the other end of the microphone from uh, some of you. So I wanted to just talk about that. Um, it's been a very positive, I don't have a single negative story to tell about that. Um, I did hear a controller yelling at a pilot the other night, uh, but from what I could tell, he kind of had it coming. Um, and there have been a couple occasions, there's been at least one occasion where somebody uh, politely vectored me away from the flight restricted zone in DC, saving the taxpayers a lot of money by not scrambling jets and saving me a lot of embarrassment. Uh, I've been graciously cleared through class B airspace uh, at night to fly over BWI. So it's been um, a, a really positive and a good learning experience. Part of that is I, I thought when I learned to fly, I'd be a very intimidated by the microphone. And I have found that to not really be that true. And I think Part of that is because I've been in enough towers and centers and tracons to see that the people on the other end aren't really spending a whole lot of time thinking about what you're saying. They're doing their job, and that's been helpful to me. But there has been one thing that I have not been able to figure out, and that is when I'm flying, whether you know I'm flying. And that sounds a little bit weird, but my flight instructor, who's an old-time DC pilot, uh, I, he insists that the FAA knows every time I'm flying. And I think he thinks that the FAA is all knowing and just knows all these things. But he has been convinced from day one that every time I fly, somebody knows. And then at some event, a controller came up to me and started laughing and saying, you know, every time you go flying, we know you're up there. And I said, oh, really? And, and she said, yeah, we actually Someone in Potomac found somebody at Freeway Airport who's now their mole, and every time you fly, they call Potomac and say, the deputy is going flying. So, and I don't know if that's good or bad, um, and I don't know if I believe it or not, but I will say that um, recently I was out, and I was getting ready to leave, and I called Potomac for my squat code, and my instructor and a friend were in the plane, and as I'm reading back the squat code, they started laughing 
because I was reading back zero, 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 one. And so they're, they're convinced that uh, you're watching me. But in any event, in all seriousness, I, I really appreciate when I'm up there uh, having you guys out there and you women out there uh, looking out for me because I know you would, whether you know, it, whether you know it's me or not. So I really appreciate your services and appreciate what you do. Um, let me just kind of close, and I know we've got a little extra time, so I'm gonna open it up for questions uh, in just a bit. But let me just close by, uh, I didn't wanna leave the GA conversation on a note suggesting that GA is, is on its way out, because I don't think that's true, actually. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, with respect to GA. One thing is that we are very, very engaged with the GA community. We work very closely on safety issues. We're hosting a safety meeting next week in, in our offices. Um, we've worked very closely with uh, AOPA and EAA on technologies like ADSB out and ensuring that GA is equipped uh, by the 2020 mandate because we think that's a very important uh, uh, technology to get out there and we wanted to make sure we stayed on track and they have been very good partners with us and we, we've worked very hard to clear obstacles to make sure that that equipage is gonna happen. Uh, we participate as fully as we're allowed to at Oshkosh and at Sun and Fun. We think that's a very important interface for us with the GA community. And GA is represented, uh, for example, on the Next Gen Advisory Committee and on uh, uh, Administrator Huerta's Advisory Committee. Um, tech Refresh, I put that up there and I'm sorry there's a typo, Norsi should be spelled with an S. And that's not a very common acronym. What it stands for is non-required safety enhancing equipment. And what it refers to is an initiative that we have underway to streamline the certification process. If you're refurbishing a 45 year old airplane, we wanna make it as easy as possible to put in the latest technology. So anything that wasn't originally required to be in that certificated aircraft we're making it easier and easier to put in, whether that's angle of attack, whether that's uh, uh, supplemental navigation equipment. So we're trying to make it as streamlined and easy as possible to refurbish old aircraft because we believe and we're already seeing that that's a pretty uh, vibrant uh, sector of the industry. There are companies out there that are spending $40,000 or $50,000 on uh, 45 year old Cessna putting $100,000 into it and really, and really selling a fantastic airplane with the latest uh, avionics. And we wanna encourage that. Part 23 rewrite, part 23 is the provision that governs manufacture of aircraft, small aircraft, general aviation. Uh, that rule, uh, proposed rule just came out and we worked very closely with industry and with the European Union to make sure that that is as streamlined and performance-based as it can possibly be to try to make that um, manufacturing and certification process as streamlined as possible. We don't wanna be a barrier um, in the building of aircraft. Obviously it needs to be done in a safe fashion, but we think, it can, we, think we can actually raise the standard of, of safety uh, by going to a performance-based uh, system. And I think that's gonna really be a, a really important part of the future for, for GA. Technology and safety, again, back to what's going on in the cockpit. The information that GA pilots have in the cockpit now is sometimes better than commercial pilots have. Um, we wanna encourage that. The, the iPad has been a revolutionary piece of technology that allows weather with ADSBN, allows weather, traffic, and navigation in the cockpit. Um, we, wanna, we wanna encourage that type of, uh, of equipage. And then finally, new technology, uh, really a broad category, but I think there are a couple of potential game changers out there. Electric propulsion being one. And if you think about the Tesla versus the Pinto or versus anything else that's out there, if you think about the ability to bring that kind of, a, uh, that kind of propulsion into general aviation uh, and even commercial aviation, that could really be a, a game changer. And there are some companies out there working on that type of technology and again, with the part 23 philosophy, we want to encourage that, that as much as possible. Increased automation, and at some point, when you talk about unmanned aircraft, uh, and you talk about automation, you start to blend together, because the more automation 
that you have, the more you can raise the level of safety and make aviation um, more accessible to a broader group of people. And then finally, I mentioned UAS. Um, one of the interesting things, we, we now have over 400,000 uh, people who have registered to operate drones in the US. And these people are aviators. And one of the reasons that we started the registration process is we wanted them to realize that they're aviators. And so this is a very easy step to bring people into the aviation world. And I know in talking with uh, AOPA, for example, they have embraced the UAS phenomenon. You might as well embrace the tidal wave that's coming over you, I guess. But I think they view it as an opportunity to bring new aviators into the system. And I think we'll start to see the blurring of UAS and manned technologies going forward. So uh, personally, I, I'm very optimistic about general aviation. I still don't know what kind of plane to buy or what makes the most sense economically, but continuing to look for that and looking, looking forward to continuing that journey. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. And again, I'm really thrilled to be able to be here today. And also I believe we've got about 10 minutes. If we wanna have some questions from the audience, I'm happy to take those. And if I can't answer them, I'll either make something up or get back with you. You ready? Yep. Good morning, sir. My name is Nate Johns uh, from Albuquerque Center. I'm a controller and the safety rep at the facility. Um, with the GA panel, uh, especially about weather that we had yesterday, um, I was curious. I happen to be a private pilot. I got my license uh, just a couple years ago. Um, I know that I probably don't speak just for myself in saying it would be an enhancement to the system if more controllers were pilots. I understand that budgets are very tight. It's an interesting political world that we live in, but what can the FAA do, and hopefully in conjunction with NACA, to incentivize more controllers becoming pilots and get instrument rated to boot? Well, I think that's a great idea, and I guess I, I have been a little surprised, and there, I suspect there's history there. Um, I think there used to be a lot of of activity that took place within the FAA, uh, ground school training and, and, and other things. And I've been surprised to not find that um, in place, but I do think that would be a, a good initiative and I'd be happy to, to, to talk about that, um, talk with NACA about that and maybe talk with some of the other organizations like AOPA and others about whether there's something we could do. Because I think that would, I think it's uh, extremely valuable for each side of the equation to see the other side and how it operates and what some of the considerations are. So I think that's a great idea. Wow, it is the early class, isn't it? I never had a class this early in college, so I don't even know who you are. I do, I have one over here. Great. Hi, good morning. Kyle Beamser from uh, Rocky Mountain Metro Tower. Uh, just kind of taking off of what Nate said, what can be done to make GA more affordable in general? Well, um, I think, you know, it, it probably helps that fuel, has, fuel prices have come down, but I noticed that the price of avgas doesn't come down quite as fast as the price of oil. Um, one of the things that has struck me as a pilot, and I think others have had this experience, is that when you learn to become a pilot, you, you have a specific goal and you set time frames and you go through a, a, a regime to get to your goal. And then you have that moment where you think to yourself, okay, now what do I do with this? You know, do, is this something I'm gonna go out on weekends and, and fly around? Is this, I'm gonna buy a plane and start going back and forth? someplace because you actually, one thing you know as a pilot is you really want to maintain your proficiency. You don't want to be that knucklehead who flies once a year. Um, and to me, it's not the cost of getting to be a pilot, it's how do you maintain that um, going forward. And you know, the aircraft need to be a lot cheaper than they are. Um, and I think part of this exercise of looking at, at the various factors was to try to understand, A, why did it happen? And B, is there something that we're doing 
that's contributing to this situation or some place where we need to get out of the way. So I don't think anybody has a good answer to that question um, unless we get a disruptive, a disruptive technology that comes in that makes it substantially cheaper, where I think electric propulsion might be that technology, but it's a few years away still. We got one right here. Uh, Deputy, thank you for your uh, showing. Uh, we have your dispatchers here, and we commend you for letting the, co the, uh, the controllers back in the cockpit. What can we do to get our controllers to our ops center to see what we can do to help them? To get to... Um, to, the, to our operations center, where we, we share joint control with the captain. Right. We want them to see what we do daily to help you and to help them. Yeah. No, I think I think that's I think I think those are all I think those are all good ideas and I think that's something we should would take up and I'm happy to to have that initiative and work with Al, uh, with uh, NATCA and Alpa and others to see if we can put some structure around that because I think it's that's that's really important. Um, and I think the way that's going to happen is if someone takes it on and, and makes it happen. So we will we will take that all we'll take that away and take a look at it. Good morning, Jennifer Post here. Um, there was a question tweeted during the weather panel the other day that Takinki answered, and I think it probably deserves an answer from a pilot, especially a general aviation pilot, and that was, how many PI reps are too many PI reps? When does it become a distraction in the cockpit, and does it? Hmm. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, that opens up a, a, a sort of a bigger question, which is about information and data generally. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I've looked at as I've looked at general aviation is why, for example, are NOTAMs um, so hard to digest? And why, if you're filing a flight plan to go 15 miles, do you get a briefing from, you know, what's going on in Seattle when you're in Maryland. Um, and there, there comes a point where there's too much data and you just can't digest it all. So how do we make that data, um, how do we let that data be in a better form um, than it currently is? And we have a lot of work underway to try to make that happen in a number of, number of ways, which could include PIREPs, certainly would include NOTAMs. Um, and, and really the goal is how do you take information and make it available in real time uh, in a user-friendly format? And, the, and, and another layer to that is, do we do that or do we let somebody else do that? Because there are private companies out there that can make those products available to pilots probably in a better, maybe user, more user-friendly format than, than, we're, than we're doing. Um, and that is, a, that is a project that we're working on uh, pretty diligently, looking at what data do we have, what other data sources do we have, how can that be made available in a standardized way so that it can be turned into usable information. So, you know, in a perfect world, you should be able to pull up your, your route of flight and see the weather graphically and see the TFRs and see the NOTAMs that are affecting that in some meaningful way and not necessarily tell you what's going on 1,500 miles away. So it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a constant challenge, but a lot of good work is going on around that. Time for one more, I think. Okay, well, I'm gonna end there. Thank you, thank you all very much, and again, thank you for what you do and for inviting me here today. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Yeah, thanks very much.